Welcome to the Rust Belt Rundown, brought to you by Rust Belt Recruiting. This podcast is designed to shine a light on the meaningful work being done in Northeast Ohio and the surrounding region. We will convene manufacturing executives and Northeast Ohio business leaders for candid discussions about their business, regional happenings, industry trends, entrepreneurship, and more. Now, let's get running on the rundown. Welcome, everyone, to episode 22 of the Rust Belt Rundown. I am your host, Paul O'Connor, and on this episode, we are joined by Sean Swinar, Chief Financial Officer at Diamond Metals Distribution. Sean, thanks so much for coming on, man. No problem. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah, of course. Um, So you grew up in Northeast Ohio. You went to Ignatius, a very uh, good and somewhat famous high school in in Ohio. And then you uh, head off to Wheeling University for college. What led you to West Virginia in your college search? Uh, So back in the day, Wheeling was Wheeling Jesuit University. Um, So sticking with the Jesuits uh, from St. Ignatius, um, looked and kind of isolated a lot of my college search to Jesuit universities. And um, while I really liked John Carroll, um, I kind of always laughed that my mom would have probably been a frequent Beachwood shopper. Hey, I'm in the neighborhood. I'm going to swing by. Um, God bless her. Love her to death. But uh, I kind of wanted to get away. Wheeling was about two and a half hours. So it kind of got me away, but I could still pop home if, uh, if need be. Nice. And uh, what were, so you mentioned John Carroll. What, what were the, uh, the other schools on the list? Um, looked at uh, John Carroll. Um, obviously, we looked at uh, Marquette. Um, which was great. Yeah, that's a cool campus. Great college town. And then um, my grandparents actually, you lived in Chicago for a while. So we looked at Loyola, Chicago and um, had a cousin that went there and stuff. Also beautiful campus, pretty cool in the city, Um, but kind of went a little bit smaller. I think Wheeling was uh, just about the size of Ignatius, actually. Wow. Um, I didn't realize that. Great experience, Um, you know, smaller class sizes, and especially it's it's helpful once you get into those higher level accounting classes and some of those higher business classes, um, you know, being smaller, you get a lot of individual attention, um, you know, kind of the recruitment out of there. It's a little bit difficult, right? Because small college, you don't get recruited by a lot of the bigger companies. So um, you got to do a little bit of your own due diligence on the recruitment side, but education wise, it was fantastic. So walk us through your background. You graduate, um, you know, what happens next? And then how did you end up in the, you know, financial realm of manufacturing? So I actually, you know, back in high school, um, you know, playing sports and stuff and trying to make a little bit of money on the side, I, you know, found myself uh, with a part-time job at Best Buy and, um, you know, down in college, I was actually working at Circuit City and stuff and bouncing back and forth between the two. And, you know, one of the really big things that I kind of started to gravitate towards were the numbers. And um, we had a really awesome general manager at Best Buy at the time. And he was very forthcoming and very transparent with the numbers. Hey, here's what our margins are looking like. Here's what the departments are doing. And um, it really got me excited to see, all right, you sold a couple of these things. Here's what we're doing today. Um, How did we do yesterday? How's our district doing? Um, You know, and really a lot of the, the numbers. And then I started seeing the trends. All right, well, here's where business is going today, I can almost start to predict the numbers. And um, it was kind of a fun experience. And it gave me that little bit of intro into math um, and really the financials. And, you know, as Mike, uh, one of the founders of Diamond Metal says, you know, our our financials tell us the score, right? It keeps the score for business and uh, lets us know if we're winning, if we're losing. And, um, you know, I kind of started to see that a little bit at an early age. And, um, you know, going through high school and, you know, obviously Ignatius, you have finance classes and whatnot, um, kind of started to direct me into that, uh, that math accounting finance type of a role. Yeah, that was going to be my follow up. I'm always curious because I am the opposite of a numbers guy. Um, I, I know the bare minimum. I can, you know, do some pivot tables and read <laughs> sure. you know, some of those, but like, again, the, the surface level. Um, right, right. So that was my question. I'm always curious, you know, were, were you good at math? Did you gravitate towards that before you went to Best Buy? Like, was it, or was it once you kind of got that first taste of it, that first experience, and then you were like, oh, wow, I really do like this. It's actually funny because we, we laugh, um, you know, my family and my siblings and stuff. We went to Incarnate Word Academy here in, uh, in, in Parma Heights. And, you know, growing up, I don't know if it's still like this, but they have like a a high level math class and then they have like a regular math class. 
I was always in the regular math classes. Me too. I, mean, I did. <laughs> I did just fine in math. Um, you know, but the creative side is probably one of those marketing type, you know, roles that I would struggle with. Um, you know, very good in math. I can kind of think I can, um, you know, figure out X if, if need be, but, uh, but that creativity side is where I would struggle a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I really enjoy math. I kind of really enjoy the numbers and telling the story of the business. And then, um, you know, I'm one that I sit behind a computer all day, but I also like to be involved in the plan, right? So I get up and, you know, you'll run numbers, you'll look at spreadsheets, do your pivot tables. And then I like to go out in the plant and actually verify with my own eyes what's going on with the business, right? All right, I'm seeing, you know, some labor trends or some things here. What's driving that? Let's go take a look. And so, you know, you get up, you go walk in the plant, you talk to the guys, you see how the orders are flowing through. Immediately, it'll validate what you're seeing. Um, yeah, I think that's so important um, because I've worked at companies where, you know, the finance department really didn't do that. They didn't right. go out into the field and see, you know, why was expenses up or why, you know, whatever, whatever the case, whatever you're sure. trying to examine. Right. And so I think that's important because sometimes eventually everything just becomes a number on a, on a screen or a line item. And if you don't really fully understand the whole picture, you, you don't see it all right. You're kind of just like one dimensional. So that's super important. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's always, and there's always a story behind the numbers, you know, and, you know, call it a, a curse and a blessing, but, you know, I graduated from, from college in 20, in 2008. And, you know, that was right. We talk about COVID and we're so, con we're so concentrating on COVID right now, but, you know, that was another huge turn for our, our country's economy. Right. And seeing all of those changes and everything that was going on in 2008, 2009, you know, I was thankful to land a job in public accounting. Um, you know, I, I, interned with one of the big four um, accounting firms. And, you know, going through that internship, I was able to see some of the privately held businesses here throughout Northeast Ohio. And I saw some big publicly traded companies. And, you know, the really cool part working with those privately, those privately held companies was getting to know the CFO, getting to work with a controller, um, going out and counting the inventory and seeing what they're making on a day-to-day -day basis, getting to talk with the plant manager the COO and having those experiences really meant a lot. And I mean, I was, you know, a month or two out of college and getting to work with these people, um, you know, very, very high up business professionals. And it was an awesome experience, but, you know, just like everybody, the, the big four, you know, public accounting firms were kind of like, Oh, I, I don't know if we're going to be bringing on new talent right now. Hey, I just graduated from college. What am I going to do? Um, you know, so thankfully I started to look and, and really, you know, what, what am I going to do? Um, and I was introduced to Apple Growth Partners down in Akron um, at the time. And, you know, now I, I read today that they just expanded to uh, a new Chicago office, which is exciting for that firm. Um, but, you know, learning and, and getting to grow and kind of getting my feet wet with Apple Growth, I ended up staying, I think, six or seven years. And it was great, you know, seeing all of the different industries here in Northeast Ohio, from healthcare to nonprofits to manufacturing. Um, you know, a lot of different service-based industries, but, you know, the one that I always went back to, the one that I always got excited with was manufacturing, right? You got to feel, you got to see and touch what they're making. You, you really got to go through the plants and, you know, anytime the clients, you'd be out there working with the clients and they'd say, Hey, you want to go for a tour in the plant? Awesome. I would love to, right? And again, you're kind of validating, you're seeing what the numbers are telling you. And, um, you know, so that's really been the foundation of, of my professional career. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't change it for anything. You know, you kind of think back and, you know, do you regret any moves? Do you, do you wish you would have stayed somewhere? And, you know, I'm one of those people, everything kind of does happen for a reason. And, you know, I'm lucky to end up where I'm at. And, you know, I've had a great experience in, in the accounting industry. And, you know, ultimately, I'm, I'm blessed to be where I'm at right now. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, okay. So tell us about the products that Diamond Metals Distribution produces. And then not only the products, then what other companies are you usually working with and selling to? Sure. So we are a tool steel distributor, a tool steel service center. And when I, take, when I say tool steel, a lot of people think like ratchets and wrenches and things like that. But there is a grade or a classification of steel, rather, that um, is called tool steel and it's referred to it in that manner because it's actually used 
to make other things. And if we think about everything that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, if it's rubber or plastic, it's likely made from a mold, right? Which mold contains some pieces and parts and components of tool steel. Um, but anything that's metal or steel or tin is likely stamped out or produced somehow, some way with tool steel. And we provide uh, the service to tool steel. And what happens in the manufacturing process of it, say if you're stamping out the hood or the fender of your car, right? You have these large die sets um, that are ultimately made up of little tiny blocks or different diameter or different shapes and size blocks of tool steel. Um, our co-founders were, uh, were very smart and they kind of saw this little niche of a business. And, um, you know, I call it little niche, but it's, it's, we're a value add service provider and our customers, most of them can do what we do here. Um, but we have the machine set up to do it. And, you know, we all know where the market and the labor market started to head in kind of that 2018, 2019 realm, right? And it's getting more, harder and harder to find folks here in manufacturing. And the nice thing about what we do is we square all of our blocks um, for those die sets. Um, so customer wise, you know, you ask who we sell to. So Diamond Metals, we have over 2,500 customers throughout North America. And, you know, our customers consist of tool and die makers, machine shops, uh, mold makers, metal stampers, um, essentially anybody that has a CNC machine that would be in need of tool steel, we're happy to provide. And the value add service that we have is we ensure that those blocks of steel are perfectly square when they ship to our customers. And so that way, when they get those blocks of steel, they're ready to go. They can slam them into their CNC machines, hit a couple buttons, they can program everything and they can get rolling with making a, the die set or, you know, finishing the mold base or, or whatever they're working on. Um, I mean, I got a, I got a couple follow-ups on that, but like, sure. so, so you mentioned um, that some of the partners and companies that you work with potentially could do this in-house. Yep. What are, why don't they, right? Like what I, I, I think I know the reasons, but what, yeah. why don't they? That's do a good it? question. So, you know, a lot of our customers, like I said, could do this. And if you have a need for apprentices or you have tool and die makers, what are they doing to drive value for your business, right? Are they squaring? Are they simply squaring blocks or are they further processing those in, you know, their state of the art machines that are capable of, you know, three, four, five access CNC machines and they're tapping and drilling or they're, they're contouring certain blocks to start eventually making that car hood, right? So we're taking some of that entry level machining off and that, that burden maybe off of our customers for a very, very nominal value added cost. Um, they got to buy the tool steel anyways. So if they're buying it from us, they're buying it from some of our competitors. Um, we're ensuring that that block is perfectly square by the time it gets there. So that way they don't have to do any additional work to it. Kind of helping streamline that value, um, that value chain for the, for the customers. Got it. That makes sense. Um, so we talk a ton on this podcast about re-education, reskilling of really the entire workforce, but of course, um, specifically the manufacturing workforce to be prepared for the future, right? And right. so I want to know, what does that look like within Diamond? Well, let me, let me rewind a little bit if I can. You know, yeah. I think the manufacturing workforce has gone through several big changes in the past. And, you know, I, I'll talk a little bit. I mean, I grew up and my mom was a nurse, right, growing up, and she was always working. They, she was, you know, at some of the big hospitals here in, in Cleveland. And, you know, my dad was in manufacturing. And I remember growing up spending a lot of time with my dad. Right. And you kind of think back, like, you know, how blessed was I? I got to really grow up and spend a lot of time with my dad. Well, it was because he was laid off a lot. And, you know, he was, uh, you know, one of X amount of welders that could do certain things and a very highly skilled welder here in, in Northeast Ohio. And he was getting laid off all the time. And, um, you know, I think right around the time I was maybe kindergarten, first grade, you know, kind of looking at his career path, he put himself back in school and went into nursing. And, um, you know, proud of him. He, he, he retired uh, this, this summer and, um, you know, really changed his life and changed his career. But, 
you know, I will say that the, the dynamic in manufacturing has changed since, you know, then, but, you know, we still have that stereotype that manufacturing careers are where you go to get laid off. And, you know, you look at a company like Diamond Metals, we've been around for 25 years. We've ebbed and flowed with, you know, some of the recessions in the early 2000s, um, the 2008, 2009 bubble that we kind of talked about. And, you know, in the past 18 months, we've kind of navigated through this COVID. And I'm happy to say that in the history of the company, we've never had a layoff. And we've always been here. We've always, um, you know, people need to come in to make ends meet, to, to pay their bills, to do whatever they need. We're here, right? We'll find something for you to do. And, um, you know, when we go out and we ask like, hey, we're slowing down. If anybody wants to split and go home, you know, you always get volunteers to do that. Um, but there's always work to do. There's always things to clean. There's always things to organize. Um, you know, we're a business just like any, anybody else. We can, we can find something for you to do. Um, but, uh, you know, the past 18 months haven't been easy, obviously, for anybody. Ebbs and flows like crazy. But, um, you know, I will, I will comment that I do think that the manufacturing career path, you know, has certainly changed. And I think that COVID in particular has kind of started to change some of the way that we look at the progression of careers, the manufacturing jobs and, and paths in general um, completely have changed. Perfect transition. Um, as a chief financial officer for a manufacturing company, navigating the financial hit of a once in a generation global pandemic is not included in the job description. Uh, so what, what has the last 18 months looked for you? I know you mentioned, you know, no layoffs, which is fantastic. Um, but like, what, what did it look like? Did you guys shut down? Were you able to keep, uh, stay open? What, what, what did it look like over the last 18 months? It's, it's been a roller coaster ride, Paul. And, you know, it's, it was, um, you know, fasten your seatbelts and hold on. And, um, you know, we started to 2019, I, you know, I started in, at Diamond in, um, in June of 2019. And throughout 2018 was a pretty unique time frame for us, where we had just finished physically doubling the size of our facility, right? We added this huge warehouse addition on. Um, we purchased and installed and, and got running about $2 million worth of state-of-the-art equipment. And so 2019 was kind of like our first year to really get our new, get used to our new flow and our new digs and everything. Um, and manufacturing was kind of soft at that point, right? We were kind of in a, I don't know, in between, a, a just it was in a stalemate, um, lack of a better terms. And, um, you know, we were anxious here at Diamond to staff up, right, to get people trained to get our new equipment running, um, really test out the capabilities of, of everything that we've just done. And it just really wasn't the right time. It didn't feel like the right time. And, um, you know, we had some big aspirations and, you know, we kind of knew that we had a little bit of, uh, we'll call it a people problem. And, um, you know, we had to correct some turnover. We had to really get a game plan for the future. How do we staff up? How do we train? Um, we had to go back to the basics and, um, you know, I'll never forget when I first got here and we were talking about the new plant and the new workflow and hiring and everything. What are we doing different now than we were before this new addition? Well, nothing. We're doing the same thing. That's why we're not seeing favorable results. This is a different company, right? And, you know, sometimes it takes a different set of eyes or a new set of eyes to kind of see some of that and help us navigate through those points. But, you know, we started to get through 19. We jumped into 20. And January just kicked off like gangbusters. It was awesome. And we're, okay, here we go. You know, we're off to the races. And, you know, we started hearing about a little bit of COVID in February. And um, March, everybody was ordering because we were starting to hear grumblings of shutdowns and what was happening throughout manufacturing. Some of our customers were getting nervous that the supply chain was going to constrict a little bit. Um, and uh, it was a different a much different month than we have seen. And, you know, very thankful we have, we have some private equity shareholders and, um, you know, private equity backing. And, you know, in talking with them, we started a daily dashboard where we look at trends for um, plant capacity. We look at trends for labor capacity, um, new customer demand. You know, we gauge all those things literally on a day-to-day -day basis. And we started that at the beginning of March. And so it was very evident 
kind of watching some of these graphs and these trends and the numbers start to play out. Okay, here we go, right? Customer demand is starting to slow. A lot of our customers got shut down. Um, and a lot of our customers started doing different things, right? So we were getting calls from customers that were starting to develop molds for the rapid COVID tests. And they were calling, hey, we're starting to do these molds. We haven't done these. You know, is there any way that we can expedite our order? Absolutely, we'll take care of it. Um, we got letters from the Department of Defense asking us to stay open because several of our customers were uh, doing tool and dies for the defense industry, right? And they had to stay open. Um, you know, so we were seeing a lot of these things. A lot of our automotive customers also got um, retooled to start to do ventilators and other uh, medical supplies, which, you know, we all knew was huge, right, during the heart of COVID. Um, so we stayed open, you know, the whole time. A lot of our customers, many of our customers did shut down. And, um, you know, we were here the whole time. Um, we kind of started to see some of the recovery, I would say, in August is ultimately, you know, looking at this on a day-to-day -day basis, you start to see any little blips on the radar. But um, we started to see some recovery in August and it's just, it was a steady climb really since then. Talk to me more about that daily dashboard that you guys put together, you know, around how you have used data in the past to help drive your decision-making, right? And, sure. and what, in what ways have you been able to use it around if you have around workforce issues but the, but first that daily dashboard i mean that's that's fantastic it's it's absolutely critical to us and, and i assume uh, you still use it to this day abs yep absolutely so we um two things were very critical for us we use a daily dashboard um and that tracks our daily sales it also gives us a month to date average kind of a rolling five day right because some days you have really really good days and some days you kind of clean the plan out and you don't really have any whip and you got to kind of prime the pump all over again. Um, so really we like to kind of look at things on a five day rolling average really to wipe out any, any outliers in the data. Um, we also look at plant production hours on a day-to-day -day basis, um, revenue per labor hour. And we start to see really what the trends are looking like, how efficient is the plants operating? Um, do we have any excess capacity? Where should we be? Um, and that, again, that's all based on, you know, historical numbers that we have at our fingertips. Um, during COVID, you know, cash flow was, cash was king. We started to look at incoming, you know, daily deposits. Um, we were looking at liquidity, right? All of those were some big, big topics for us. So looking at our, our borrowing base and, and ensuring that our banking partners were, were happy and up to speed with everything that we were doing. And along the lines of the banking situation and cash flow, um, what we do and we still do weekly is a 13 week cash flow, right? I look out 13 weeks. How, what bills do I need to pay? When do I have payroll? What do I anticipate some inventory purchases being each, every single week? And again, that helps us plan cash flow. Um, we can see if we're going to be a little light, when we're going to be a little bit heavy, what's kind of coming and going. And, you know, ultimately some of those things like the daily dashboard and the 13 week cash flow also helped us with the PPP loan, right? Both applying for the PPP loan and applying for forgiveness on a PPP loan. I have all that data at our fingertips. Um, so kind of doing some of those things on a weekly basis or daily basis um, has helped us not only be able to navigate and tell us how many employees do we need, right? What's the trend look like in customer demand versus labor capacity, um, but also ultimately like where, where are we going, right? Where does this look like in 13 weeks? if if, if we're going over a cliff, I got to know, right? And, um, you know, we have, we have about 80 employees, um, you know, so we have 80 livelihoods in our, in our hands every single day. And um, it's a big responsibility, but, you know, without some of these tools, again, without some of this data, are you really making the right decisions, right? Yeah, 100%, 100%. Um, so let's talk hypothetically for a second, 10 to 15 years from now, if manufacturing could alleviate all of their workforce issues and be as close to fully staffed across the country as possible, what would you envision to be the trickle down effect of that? Ultimately, the trickle down, I think, would really impact the consumers very, very positively. Um, you know, I think we saw a little bit during the pandemic of some reshoring, you know, which was exciting for all of us. I know, you know, Sometimes when we hear reshoring, you get goosebumps, right? That's, 
it's a great term for, for the United States. And, um, you know, we've also, we've gone decades, you know, I, I know I opened up with kind of the story about growing up and, you know, my dad was a welder and he got laid off. We've gone decades without promoting jobs in manufacturing and careers in manufacturing. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't go to college or may not be on that college route, but they need to find a career. And there's tons of careers. And I could, I could of, not agree with you more. I think this is, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. I think this is such a missing piece in like, okay, for example, I went, I graduated high school in 2007, college in 2011. There was not one guidance counselor, not one who was recommending a remedial school, a trade school, go, here's where you can go to be an electrician, a welder, right. not one of them. Now, what people don't realize now, if you could, now a lot of this is supply chain, supply and demand. And the, sure. but like, if you call someone to dig up your lawn or an electrician, anything on your home right now, it's insane, right? It's impossible, and almost. People, they should just lead with the salary. People have no idea. Everyone is making six figures. Everyone right. in those industries, in, in not, I'm not saying all, but again, like that's that's huge. So sorry, keep going. But I mean, that's something no, I, that we have talked about a ton. Yeah, and and I just think that we as a society, right, have just not promoted no, anything outside of a four year university. And um, you know, Mike, our 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 co founder here at Diamond, he'll tell you. You know, he went to college and he kind of went on the entrepreneurial route because he wouldn't have really done very well outside of that. Right. And I, he, he told me a story one time that one of his teachers told him, Mike, you better start your own company. You know, and sure enough, he did. But, <laughs> yes. um, you yeah. know, there's some people that go to college that, um, you know, not saying he shouldn't have. But, you know, there's a lot of people that may not go that route. And I don't know if they're not looked at or they're not encouraged but there's nothing wrong with not going to college. And, you know, I blessed to have two sons myself. And, you know, if, if they decide not to go to college, I mean, there's plenty of successful opportunities for them, um, you know, support them e either way. Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great career paths, both here in manufacturing and, and outside of manufacturing, but, you know, Northeast Ohio, mm -hmm. Cleveland, Ohio is uh, a big manufacturing hub. It's a huge manufacturing hub. And, you know, we go back to, you know, the city of Brook Park, right, right down the street from us. We're in Cleveland, kind of by the airport. Brook Park was almost built because of the automotive, you know, areas over here. It was built fast. It was built quick. And, you know, ultimately the people that were working in automotive, kind of like that Lordstown area, need some place to stay, right? And that was Brook Park. Um, you know, there's, a, again, there's a ton of manufacturing here in Cleveland. There's nothing wrong with manufacturing. Um, I would love to see us just as a society, as a community, continue to promote um, manufacturing jobs. Yeah. Um, back on that college thing, I, I think some of the smartest people now have realized I'm going to go to a community college for two years. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to save thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. I'm going to get great grades. And then people transfer to schools that they otherwise would not have got into straight out of high school. Right. Um, and that to me is genius. Fine. Then you pay, you know, two years to go to wherever a Stanford or, you know, wherever, wh whatever it is. But um, I think one thing, a, a couple of things are changing around college. One for the first time ever, major companies, Google, Facebook are not requiring a college degree. Wow, um, I didn't in, know that. Yeah. That's in, huge in lieu of experience. I mean, they're not just going to hire you if you don't right. have, right? Of course. But let's say you didn't go to college and then uh, for the last four years, you've been learning how to code and worked at a company as a programmer. Well, what's better than that? I mean, I'd rather right. hire that person. You, you've been doing it. You're, you just haven't been learning, right? So um, yeah, it's, it's going to get real interesting in the next 10 to 15 years. I don't have any children yet. You know, at some 18 to 20 years down the road, what does college look like for them um, cause there's just no way it can continue to get more expensive. No. And just kidding. You know, again, I mean, going to a four year university and, you know, Wheeling Jesuit was, was great. Um, and then, you know, I went and, and did my MBA and, you know, I mean, you will walk out of college with some hefty college bills mm -hmm. and some, some huge debt. Um, again, I'm, I'm very lucky and thankful to be in the position that I'm in, um, but there's other, there's other ways and there's other opportunities for everyone to be successful. 
And, you know, if, if you're not college bound, that doesn't mean that doesn't define you, right? That shouldn't mean that you're not successful. It shouldn't mean that you don't have a successful career path. Um, there's plenty of things to do. There's plenty of things to do, period. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. All right. We'll get you out of here on this. Um, some, some guests think it's the hardest question we joked before we started recording, but, uh, talk to us about where maybe some of your favorite takeout joints are favorite pizza places in Cleveland, whatever it is, favorite, favorite restaurants in Cleveland. And I will, I will go on the record. First time saying this, I just moved to Ohio a year ago. Um, I grew up in the Connecticut, New York area. So pizza is pretty sacred to us. Okay. Um, but Cleveland pizza is so much better than Columbus. It's not even close. I mean, well, it's, that's good. it's not that's close. Good to, that's I, good to hear. Yeah. So yeah. pizza joints, pizza yeah. joints. Whatever Paul, you want. It doesn't you. have to be pizza. It doesn't have to be pizza. Whatever you want. Pizza <laughs> joints, I will tell you, there is uh, probably our favorite place is in Lakewood. Um, and it's called Tamori's. Tamori's okay. Pizza. little unconventional, right? You're not going to go in there and get a pepperoni pie. Um, but uh I believe his name's Danny over there. He makes an awesome pizza, okay. uh, very heavy Italian accent. Um, he goes and he gets all the freshest ingredients. If he doesn't have fresh ingredients, he takes the items right off the menu. Um, wow. Thin very crust. Cool. It's unbelievable. Again, it's it's non-traditional types of type of pizza, um, but absolutely phenomenal. Love the pizza there. My wife and I we do like uh, we do like tacos, so we'll hit hit Barrio from time to time. Yep. Um, always a favorite of ours. But uh, sadly, we really like Ruth Chris and they fell as a victim of COVID, unfortunately. So, oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Ruth Chris downtown um, didn't make it. So Man. we got to find a new steakhouse. So new steakhouse needed in new the steakhouse Cleveland area. Yep. yep. All right. So there's an opportunity there for some of our listeners. Maybe we'll get one. That's um, right. Awesome. If anybody has any great recommendations too, I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah, for sure. So Sean, listen, re really appreciate you coming on. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, before we get out of here, wh where can people find you, connect with you, you know, learn more about uh, uh, Diamond Metals? Um, you know, diamondmetals.com is our, is our website. There's a contact us page. All my information is on there as well as several videos about us, what we do. Um, we put a lot of money in to our hiring and recruiting and also some of our, you know, again, some of the videos. And um, we think that right now with the labor market, you got to set yourself apart a little bit. And while everybody has job descriptions posted all over the place, um, we tried to highlight some of our plant crew, some of our, you know, our plant manager, some of our shift supervisors, and really have them tell you about what it's like working here. So um, check out our videos. You know, if you need to have any questions or any follow-ups, happy, uh, happy to connect. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sean. We appreciate you coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll talk with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Rust Belt Rundown. Make sure you check us out at rustbeltrecruiting.com. The Rust Belt Rundown is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and click on five stars if you enjoyed this episode. See you next time.